For any training program to be effective, both learning and transfer of training needs to be present and needs to be thought about before the actual training program is implemented. Now there, cert there needs to be certain conditions present in order for learning to occur. Number one, the, the trainees must have the opportunity to practice and actually receive feedback. So if you think in education, that's why uh, schools have homework. So you can practice what you learn and then your teacher should give, give you feedback whether or not that was effective or not. Uh, it should be meaningful training content, meaning that what you are learning should have value and it should assist you in your job. They need to, company needs to identify any prerequisites that the trainees may need to complete the program successfully. You could take the best training program in the world on being an electrical engineer, but if you don't have that prerequisite knowledge, there's going to be no value to it. And then trainees also uh, need to learn through observation and experience, but also make sure that that work environment supports the use of those skills. Are those skills valued by your management, supervisors? Is there a benefit to doing that? The model of learning and transfer of training highlights a lot of those principles we just talked about, where you look at the trainee's characteristics as far as their prerequisites, what knowledge they have, what skills they have, the actual training design, and the work environment, and how that impacts the learning process for the trainee and also the transfer of training, meaning how does that trainee actually utilize those skills once they leave the training, and how do we ensure that those just become commonplace and something they can do on a daily basis. To assist us in understanding the learning process and figuring out how exactly to build a training program that actually provides a learning opportunity. There are several theories we can use and we can uh, touch on to actually ensure that our training program is effective. There are seven of them listed here. You can find more other places and I'll highlight each one of these. The book does a really good job of explaining them as well. The first is reinforcement theory and that is the positive and negative reinforcement and the idea that you can change behavior with both positive and negative reinforcements. The positive being uh, something pleasurable, a pleasurable outcome because of an act you did and negative meaning that they eliminate something that is negative and that entices people to work. It's important for the trainer to identify what these are, what both the positive and negative reinforcements are and then also to link those uh, outcomes to the learners acquiring new knowledge, skills, or changing behaviors. The book does a great example of using the company talking about safety and how they could increase their safety as far as using reinforcement theory. The next learning theory is social learning. And this emphasizes that people learn by observing others who model those behaviors, but it's important that those people are both credible and knowledgeable on the subject area. The, a great example of this is me and my brother both rollerbladed and I learned to skate backwards before he did. Well through watching me skate backwards and model that behavior he was then able to pick it up quite easily and he was then skating backwards and I think that's a perfect example of watching someone else doing it, observing it. I provided him a little bit of feedback and then he was able to actually do it. Next is goal theories or goal setting theory which assumes that behaviors result from a person's conscious goals and intentions. The book does a great job with the pizza example talking about how setting goals can influence training and development and a lot of people are focused to reach certain goals and to you know, motivate themselves in order to learn. And it's a good way to direct their energy and sustain effort over time. There are a couple different goal theories. There's or goal orientations, which is the actual view held by the trainee in a learning situation. You have the learning orientation where you're trying to increase the knowledge of learning behind the task and you also have performance orientation where you're more focused on the actual performance. A great example of this is keyboarding. 
and when I would teach keyboarding you had students who wanted to learn the correct and proper procedures and they were more focused on the learning orientation and you had students who were more focused on the performance orientation and if they made 20 typing mistakes but you know had 80 words a minute they were happy obviously the learning per, uh, orientation is a better approach to take and to try to get your employees to realize that it's important to learn it and not just focus on the performance orientation of a specific training program. Needs theory suggests that in order to motivate learning trainers should identify trainees needs and what a need is is a deficiency that a person is experiencing at any point in time. When I think about the needs theory I always go back to Maslow and education the whole idea of how can we expect students to learn if they're hungry, if they're cold, if they're not if those needs aren't being met, how can we expect them to learn? That's what I always think about with the needs theories. Uh, it does help to explain the value that a person places on certain outcome. The book does a great job of giving the example of the secretaries who are worried about losing their job. So how much, how important is learning how to improve their typing if they're not even sure they're going to have a job? The expectancy theory implies that a person's behavior is based on three factors. You have expectancies or the idea that the employee can actually learn the content of the program. Then you have informality, which is the idea that the learning that occurs will be beneficial and lead to better outcomes. And then finally you have the balance, which is the value that a person places on the outcome. The adult learning theory developed out of the need for having a theory that addresses how adults learn. We knew and we have several great theories on how children and adolescents learn, but we needed something to help explain how adults learn. So we came up with andragogy, which is the theory of adult learning. Now there's some assumptions in here that your book talks about, and they're all good points to highlight that adults learn differently than children and adolescents, and these need to be taken into account when you're developing a training and development program. Our final learning theory is the information processing theory, which looks at how things work both internally and externally. Internally emphasizes the, the internal processes needed to capture, store, retrieve, and respond to messages. From an external perspective, it looks at how different external factors can influence the learning process and how we actually go about learning in a given setting. How can we ensure that what we are actually training people do transfers back to the job? What can we do to ensure that this is happening so that we are not wasting time, money, and effort and getting no reward for that? I've included a video that highlights some of these some of these things that we need to be aware of, but there are some theories that we can follow to assist us in that. And when we look at the transfer of training theory, there are both closed skills, which refer to training objectives that are linked to learning specific skills that are to be identically produced by the trainee on their job, which leads into the identical elements and the idea that the, I the perfect way to transfer the training is to create a identical learning environment in which the skills learned can be taken directly to the back to the job because they're in the exact same environment. This may be training them in their working environment or recreating a situation that is identical to their training environment. The other is the open skills which are just linked to more general principles and ties into the stimulus generalization approach which is the idea that let's teach people these key principles and key behaviors and they can then apply those to each situation. I think the book uses the example of a call center where there is no way to replicate this environment a hundred percent. Then finally we have the cognitive which goes back more towards the information processing theory and looks at the way that we mentally address these issues and what approaches we need to take with that. Now that we've read about and listened to the different uh, learning and transfer of training theories, 
we're ready to address a few questions. Number one, what are the physical and mental processes involved in training? And your book does a really good job of talking about each of the processes. Um, what are the external instructional events? And talking about different forms of instruction on how we can make sure that that occurs. Then you have the learning cycle and how does learning and transfer occur? And it talks about four different stages where you have the concrete experience where the problem is actually observed and then you actually reflect on that. You come up with some ideas in the abstract conceptualization and then in the active experimentation you actually apply those ideas and directly to the problem to solve that issue. The final question we have to be willing to ask ourselves is, you know, do trainees have different learning styles? And I think we've we've kind of come to the conclusion that they do and that no one training program is going to fit all all trainees. So let's tie everything together that we've learned today and think about how we can actually create a training program that allows for the transfer of training. You know, what are the features of instruction and in the work environment that are necessary to facilitate learning and the transfer of training. Number one is objectives. Uh, employees learn best when they have objectives and they know what's going on in the training program. It tells them what the purpose of the training program is and what the expected outcomes. Think about every class that you take. If you look at the syllabus, there should be either course objectives, student objectives, learning objectives that tells you what you are going to get out of the course and it serves as that guide so that way you know what is going on. Next there needs to be meaningful content and what this implies that the content needs to be of value to the trainee. They are getting uh, something out of this. They are learning something that can apply to their job and is, a benefic and is beneficial to them. Next, there needs to be opportunities to practice, meaning that whatever you're learning, you need to be able to apply that and actually practice that and have the actual opportunity to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Uh, there's this whole thought that people learn best from trial and error, and through practice you can do that. You can take, um, you can try different techniques and figure out what works and what doesn't, and it actually aids in the learning process. Uh, there needs to be methods for committing training content to memory and there are different approaches you can take with that is actually ensuring that what you are learning or what the trainee is learning learning that is actual committed to memory if you guys um, you know take a class and at the end of the class you take your final and you move on and um, if you had to take that same final a few years later and you would probably fail it obviously you didn't commit what you learned to memory and more than likely something happened um, it through that instruction that, that didn't allow you to commit that to memory. It could be the object. It could be the content wasn't there. You didn't maybe have the opportunity to practice. Something happened why you weren't able to commit that to your memory. Next, you need feedback, which is really important to receive feedback both from what you're doing correctly and what you're doing incorrectly, and to learn from that. You also observation, experience, and social interaction. It's good to get. Uh, interaction both from the instructor but also from your peers and to learn from each other and observe from each other and get the experiences of, of watching other people do that specific task and learning how they do it and the approach that they take with it. You need proper coordination and arrangement of the training program. This is more of an administrative issue in that when you set up your training program you need to make sure that you've addressed any issue or any potential issues because you don't want that to distract from the actual training that is going on. I was at a conference last year and I was given a presentation on the internet and the internet went out. So, you know, I had 10, 15 minutes left and I kind of had to wing it because everything I had set up was through the internet. Well, Realistically, they should maybe had something in place in case that happens, although I don't know what you can really do in that situation. But for mine, it was just a conference and not that big of a deal. But in an actual training environment, that could really uh, hampen or hamper the effectiveness of the training program and have a negative impact on the overall experience. You also need to encourage trainee responsibility and self-management. Trainees need to be invested in this and be actively engaged and 
actually get something out of this. You can't force them to do this, but you should encourage this. I'm sure you guys have all gone through different training programs for whatever job. And if you're not actively engaged and are really being responsible, you're not getting a whole lot out of it, and it's not very beneficial. And then you need to ensure that the work environment supports learning and transfer. Something we've talked about in here numerous times, the idea that if management, if the work environment doesn't support that learning and doesn't support that transfer, how beneficial is it really true to you as an employee? And yes, it might have been a great training program, but if you go back to your work environment and your manager doesn't care if the work environment doesn't allow you to actually apply what you've learned, there really isn't a whole lot of value to it. I realize it's been a very uh, long and intense chapter, but I think it's important to understand the learning process and the learning theories behind developing a training and development program. And it will really serve as a basis for us as we proceed onward.